Okay, great. All right, good evening, everybody. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the final installment of the Right to Speak uh, Poetry Workshop series. Um, the session you've just joined will focus specifically on tools for multimedia production. Um, but before we get into it, I would firstly like to give thanks to the UK Zidane Center for Creative Arts and Hear My Voice NGO who are jointly presenting this workshop series and their partners, the Guta Institute, the French Institute of South Africa, Flanders and Wallonie Ruxels. And also a shout out to the force that is Kagaza Mahare for coordinating um, this project as well. Um, my name is Karen Jumba, and I am part of the team who worked on the production Poetics for Transformation, which was circulated prior to this workshop. Um, I also just have to then give a shout out to my team members, Daniel Sheldon, Svo, Ntlantla, Nathan Redpath, Deshen, Gabiba, Ian, Sarah, Kanyo, and Kulego, who all played a pivotal role in bringing that production to fruition. Um, just by way of background, um, that production, the CCA really gave us free reign to explore how we could use archived footage of performances from Poetry Africa Festival to develop an argument or a narrative around the relationship between poetry and social justice as it manifests through more recent hashtag movements. Um, and it gave us room to really experiment with enriching the existing content with photo photography, um, with animated illustrations, with uh, audio interviews, with um, original music. And that's what made it a truly multimedia production. Um, but this one, it's just one experience of the ways in which you can produce or work in this way. Um, and so for today, I'm really honored to share this platform with our workshop co-leaders who are Kaya Masego, Mbali Velagazi, and Mutle Motibe, who each have had like, I think over a decade of experience of creating multimedia productions and have been generous enough to reflect on that and share what their journey of working in this way has looked like and how it can guide and inspire the next set of humans to complement their poetic practice in this way. Um, so we're going to start the session with a kind of show and tell um, from our co-leaders um, to offer a more kind of diverse picture of what we're talking about when we talk about this thing or this creation called a multimedia production. Um, and just for your navigation or like a compass, Thereafter, we'll kind of go into a very focused discussion around how they conceptualized and made those multimedia projects and some of the frameworks that informed that process, especially in terms of the skills and the hardware and the software that they needed to be able to make those productions possible. Um, and we are also throughout the session going to make um, a Q&A available through the chat, um, but we'll really try to consolidate this towards the end of the session. Um, so please feel free to pop your, mess your questions and comments and messages into the chat as we go along. Um, and with all that being said, I would like to introduce our first uh, co-leader, who is Guy Maseko. I'm going to invite him to introduce himself and also show off his fantastic work. Over to you, Kai. I, I don't know if we've lost Kaya. Okay. I think we've lost Kaya. Okay, technology, thank you. <laughs> on, on a tech session on top of that, Mbali, as you were saying. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to hand over to Mutle. Would it be possible for me to screen your video and we can take it from there in terms of introducing yourself and then playing your video? 
Yes, okay. it will be possible for us to do that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I think you can jump onto that and then hopefully then Kaya will be back. If not, um, I'm more than willing to introduce and we take it from there. Okay, cool. Do you want to share with the good people who you are while I upload your video? Yes, uh, so my name is Mutle Mutibe. I am a spoken word artist. I am a yoga teacher and all manner of poetry related things and a writer. So um, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for I think 20 odd years. And um, this is where I am right now. And you know, it's it's been a journey on, it, on its own. Um, but it's one I'm still exploring and one I'm hoping to delve deeper into. So um, without further ado, this is um, one of my famous pieces of works where I took a video that already existed. It was another artist's video and I just, I felt I could write something on it and also it would complement my work or complement the words that I was writing. So um, this is what came out. Um, and then we can talk about it later after the video plays. So it's Justin meets Mutle or Mutle meets Justin. So um, enjoy. Chalk in hand, deposit writing on earth. Lines are drawn, sketchy past, fading future dawns. I'm searching for data, hoping my serials coded. I've noted to filter out their noise. Morpheus keeps selling me secondhand dreams with no ending. A fed up reality keeps calling for this poet to quit. No, must stay focused. Outline mission, numbers, consonants, vows, I've paid for admission. The objective is to remind myself, the ancient proverb spoken by a dying star of how puppets love art with no strings attached. The puppeteer keeps throwing away my severed pieces. Osiris aid my iris. I have misplaced my hearing in my eyes and now measure insults by the decibel. I have my name written in the stars, but I'm known by a different kind of alias. No, must stay focused. Use art for healing. for healing. Step one, write with feeling. Understand the steps past the surface. Steady yourself by breathing. There's more to rhyming than meets the suffix. Align mystery with your letters. Let wizardry be your postman. Start at the end, end in the middle. Once in a while, it's okay to lose your footing. I'm a pestilence in heart, death is your monarch, but you must learn to push through. Step two, still your mind, distill the spirit, stomp the earth, bodily emotions, pour out your heart, loosen your joints along with your tongue, words are the audience, write yourself into existence. With your burdens, step Three, master the art of slowing time down. Plant your knees in the air and hold the earth up from spinning. Now. Mutle? Yes, I'm still here. All right, fantastic. You want to walk us a little bit through that uh, production? Yes, okay, so the light is fading on me, so I'm going to go off screen for a bit, um, but then I'll be back, but I'll keep talking via audio. Um, so how I created this piece, it was actually a first time attempt at trying to figure out, because I'd always loved merging poetry with audio. Um, when I originally started, it was just me getting on stage and then doing the, 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 the performance part of it. And then I took the audio I used while writing in order for me, in order for me to, in order for me to, to complement the work and not make the music take over the work. So I figured what would happen if I were to take the visuals and actually have them amplify the wording. So, um, I came across this video, which was. Phenomenal for me to watch it the first time because I think a lot of us can identify with the kid and the story and being bullied, but also having a special part of you that someone else might see, but you don't think other people see it. Because I felt that's how I've always felt about poetry is that, you know, um, very few people saw my abilities in it. But once someone saw it, that's when I, I exploded into actually delving into it and exploring this art form. So, yeah, um, I took the video, the recording of the audio funny enough, was done in Cardiff, 
um, when I went to Wales and I was doing an exchange program via word and sound. So this 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 whole thing it felt so um, uh, I don't know like it it had it, it was confirming my growth in the art form that I was actually uh, this kid who had grown really being into this art form and here I was recording it in Cardiff because I had been put there by the very mm. art form that I'd actually you know fallen in love with. Um, so yeah, the the creative process of it is that I literally watched this video for three months straight without writing to it. And then I waited for the words to come to me. And then once the words came, I then matched it to the, the, the audio visual. So the audio visual, I did not write it. Um, I mean, yes, I did write with the, with the movements of the kid in mind, for frame for frame. I wanted to learn that as perfectly as possible. By the time, um, the story came to me of what it is I wanted to write and how it is I wanted to inspire myself because at the time I actually wanted to quit poetry. I had had enough of the hurdles, the financial issues, and I wanted to ask myself if I could write a piece that would bring me back to life, what would those words be? And that's how mm. Justin came, to, came into the picture. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the story behind Justin. Um, if anyone wants a frame by frame discussion on it, I'm also <laughs> still <laughs> willing to discuss that as well. But yeah, that's, that's what inspired the piece for me. It was yeah. also exploring this new way of presenting this art form. I've always been into music and I've always been into creating images in people's heads. And I, I, I figured, what would it look like if the people could actually have the images and then mm. amplify the images I'm trying to put into your head? So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Mutle. And we are going to touch, I think, a little bit more deeper in terms of how that kind of relationship works between concept and then what actually comes first in the process. Is it looking at something? Is it seeing something? Is it actually writing the words? But thank you for that beautiful introduction to what you have done. Um, which is pretty cool <laughs> just like so a much. small 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 inside it yeah, but yeah we'll get into it more um definitely. uh the next co-leader who is going to present her work is Mbali Vilagazi and Mbali is an award-winning South African poet she's a speaker she's a climate change advocate she's a creative strategist and founder of the thought experiment and she's also really nice to chat to during the week. She made me laugh a lot um, and I appreciate that. Um, and what I'm going to share with you uh, today is a reel of multiple of her works that she's done. Um, and Bali, would you like me to play the video first or would you like to introduce, uh, introduce it? If I unmute, if I start there, wouldn't be, like be a great start. Um, hi everybody, hi Karen, thank you so much. I think just briefly, um, to put it in there is that it, it kind of it's a, a snapshot of the things I've tried to do over the course of my career and it's just some of the areas of exploration but I think we can get into each of the pieces following I think once people have had an idea all right great thank you so much so here we yeah. go they told me I should try shutting up sometime who are you? Who do you think you are? What right do you have? And, and what, what makes you makes and what so makes you so special? So special? Too cheeky, too strong, too womanish, too opinionated, too much of self. Not enough. Not enough. Be someone else, be something else, be anything, just don't be you. Enshrouded in my longing eye, look at the clouds. The galaxy is an endless question my wings fold in. I get so lonely on Sunday mornings. I hug the bed till half past three. Ignore the phone's demands on me. 
I try to write this lying down Again, again, autumn in Cape Town Before I know it, I'm knee deep On Sunday morning, the days before fade into nothing more than just the days before. On Sunday mornings, I am a ghost town. I am the voice of your tomorrow, speaking into your today. This is a story of second chances, potential, and opportunity. I am here to tell you that we didn't jet off to Mars. We didn't have to chart a course towards the stars. This is Earth. This is now. What did you do when the phone call stopped? When friends and family found your pain too hard? When they no longer had the words for you? When they stopped coming around? What did you do with the silence? What did you do with the space? The empty chair in every empty room, in every family picture. The empty spaces that should be for everywhere you go. There's so many of them shit! Why don't they just go home? Paul. What? is home. Where is home? What defines home? And when does a place stop being For me, just home is a place, place where I can be free. The experiences that I've had in places that I have wanted to call home was being reminded that this is not actually your space. University of and the area they called Kwazlangezwa. So you wouldn't feel out of place anywhere. Nobody treated you any differently to what your parents would treat you. As a, a brother recalls how his sister came home in tears. Marked and older than her 16 years, knees trembling, too traumatized to speak. The words, cold nights wrapped in, patchworks of anxiety sewn together unsteadily, the last remains of her fragility when no one remembers her dignity. She had the audacity to wear a miniskirt to note taxi rank today, to walk the streets, with courage and joy, her and a friend, unhurried innocence and schoolgirl banter in animal print and black leggings. It was too much, or too little, for the rising chorus of groping eyes, a stampede of unwelcome, indignant hands grabbing, grabbing at their thighs, grabbing at their sides. The exacting toll of 50 grown men, fathers and brothers, co-workers and cousins, lovers, who should have been protecting them, taunting them, insulting them. They took pictures. They jeered. The terror in the possibilities at North, always palpable and urgent, the stench of sweat and urine and money-changing hands, 60 grown men encircling children. The air closing in. So thank you, Mbali, for that share. Um, before we get into the, the kind of discussion, is there any summary you want to offer or can I dig in? <laughs> oh, quickly, based on that. Well, <clears throat> I do want to say, and I think it's important just even before we break out into our conversation, that a guiding principle, true north framework, um, light for me has always been the description of poetry as uh, poetry is the discipline of how seemingly incongruent ideas meet. 
And so that immediately opens up the space for you that that is the territory you are in, that there is no single way of doing or being or seeing that is required of you. And so that's always just been how I have stepped off the page to, in terms of how I think about, about my poetry. It's never been a case of, I want to create additional elements to, it just was always incorporated in that. And that poetry for me is a way of seeing, it's a way of being, it's, it's who you become, it's who you are. So that kind of just shows, I chose those specifically because I think they foreground different things. So just briefly in the beginning, that came a little later um, in the career, and that is fragments of work from different spaces. And so at that stage, I was already someone who was thinking around creating a production of my work. I'd had that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. one, that piece comes from an opening of a broader piece. So that's another thing that we, we, you know, when you, it's, we take it for granted that work in multimedia, but there comes a point where you actually, your thinking, your perspective has to be that I need to enlarge this thing. It's not just me mm -hmm. on stage with my voice. I can actually create a full body of work that I then have a product that I can take into the market, whether locally or abroad. So that was that. Second, I think that just indicates collaboration which is a point um, that will probably come up a little bit earlier as one of the mechanisms. So I'm a great um, supporter of collaboration. I, my career has been helped by collaborating with uh, other poets and poets and then also other artists. So that's also another conversation that we don't, you, you might not necessarily have everything you need, but you can be in conversation with somebody who does. So that particular artist is Kyle Scott who is half South African, half German. And he's a wunderkind at media, like he's a lecturer and that's his specialty. So he was somebody that I learned a lot from in my formative years. That came very, very early. That sort of number two was in 2008, I think. Then mm -hmm. the second one is just um, our work sitting within the market in terms of the broader skill set that poetry gives you in, in terms of how you can take care of yourself in terms of how you can build a life as one of the examples of the ways in which you need to diversify. So that was mm. the commercial. So that's a commercial for Sun International. And, mm. and that's to do with, uh, you know, my climate advocacy work. But I was able to create the piece, design the visual language of it and perform it. And those are skills that come from poetry. And mm. then the, I think the clip from, um, from Poetry Africa itself. That's just there as another means of creating a multiplicity of voices in your work as well, because that's also interesting. That creates diversity um, and it creates a dynamic element to the work, but it's also important when we think about, we're not just creating entertainment. So a lot of the time, there are things that we're talking about that are, are topical, that are weighty, that are urgent, that are important in our society, in the world. And I found that another way is to, you have a platform, you have a stage. So it's important as well to open that up. Um, you are a conduit to be able to poetically, because it's poetic justice as well, isn't it? That you can bring in other voices and not just other voices, but it's also an opportunity to bring in other languages into mm -hmm. that. So finally, the third yeah. one, the third, the, the last one, which just touches on um, what Mutle was saying about exchanges. So that came about as a result of a cultural exchange organization. For me, it was the British Council and that I connected with a poet in the UK and a poet in the Netherlands. And we created a poetry theater production that then toured South Africa, toward the UK and toward the Netherlands as well. And so that piece was born out of our specifically making a point of interpreting the text for a multimedia. So there was film, there was audio, and there was movement um, as a part of our production. Mm. But we'll get into how, how we develop that sort of thing. But so those are the, are the different aspects of, and the different things that I hope to draw on during the course of the session as, as useful resources and ways to mm. think around the challenges. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mbali. And I see Kaya has rejoined us, but Kaya, if you don't mind, I think I would like to get to the point of discussion in terms of kind of unpacking the stuff that both Mbali and Mukle have shared. Um, we have really good or really fantastic examples of what a multimedia production could look like. 
Um, but just to get into the nitty gritty of somebody who's approaching this work from a conceptual <laughs> level to a frameworks level to a hardware level, what that really looks um, looks like. Is that okay with you? Yes, I'm hoping, that's okay Kaya, with me. I'm hoping you can hear me. Oh, okay, yes, great. that's okay. With but me. I would like to direct. I would like to direct this first kind of um, shell or nutshell question to you. So I mean, in the lead up to this session, across the across the panel or the dis discussants or the the humans who are in this room, um, you made reference to the fact that poetry or writing are at the center of your productions and the use of other media as a means to amplify what you're doing or want to do with text. Um, and I really want to unpack that in terms of how that plays out at a conceptual level and in the process of making. And so I really wanted to firstly ask, is there like a general approach you have to making a multimedia production and how does it differ from writing a traditional poem um, from your side? All right, um, general approach. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never been known for general approaches. I usually prefer spontaneity and using the tools that are available to me. Um, but when it comes to actually being, being applicable and, and doing work right then at the time, a general approach would be that I assemble the tools that I want. I built myself a sort of template for how I want to work. So if I'm making audio material, for example, that's going to support my poetry, um, let me see if I can send a link here. Um, check out that link. That's uh, poetry that was assembled with graphics as well as audio. So it's three different media that are working together to make one piece of work. And we call the work Eyeless. We've only published about 50 of those. So whoever's got them in the world has a very rare thing, which is mm. audio as well as graphic work, as well as poetry. Now the poetry is at the center of the work. None of the audio or the graphics would have happened without the poetry. And so the poetry is everything to me. So to make a piece happen like this, we had to, what's the term that we collaborate, yeah? I called up my friend Ashley and I said, you know how to draw. I don't draw very well. You can draw what I want. Let's work. And these poems weren't written yet. We wrote them as the drawings and the writing came together. So it was the synthesis of media. And I went off afterwards and I sat on Ableton Live and made songs to work with it. So the approach is that I assemble the tools and I have a basic template. I get my tools, which is Ableton Live first, and I get my artists, which I may need for the work if it's going to involve a visual element. And if we're not going to use a visual element, then I have to find out what's going to draw people. What's going then to pull the attention in? Because writing is writing. People who read writing are going to mm. want writing. But people who may not mm. want writing but are interested in intellectual content need something to call them into this thing. So that's mm. why I went. Um, I, I realized, you won't believe, you won't believe how emphatic and physical I am, but I've had the video of this whole time, um, gesturing and hands all over the place. You would have missed it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so to make eyeless, um, which is, is just but <laughs> one example, we did a, a, a lot of, of synchronous work to assemble it. Now I'm gonna show you something which is recent, which is recent, which was an audio track, but it involves the writing very much as the center of the whole thing, because without the writing, none of I get to sit down and actually work happens. I have to put pen to paper first. And I, I will never stop calling myself a poet, even if they say I'm a musician or an artist of any sort. Sure, I make videos, sure I can make songs, sure I can do graphics, but I am the poet always and ultimately. And so if I'm going to move work forward, I move it under a hashtag, so to say, of poetry, always. Mm. Cool. Even my novels, when my friends read my novels and my novellas, they're like, this is long form poetry. Like it probably is. Mm. Because even though it's a novel, it's coming from that central place, which says, 
the media must push forward the voice of my poetry, even if it's a novel, even if it's a song. Yeah. So if you check out Fragment, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that's very much about multidisciplining myself and learning mm -hmm. all these different skills to boost the central heart of my work. Cool. That's a, that's a nice way of encapsulating it, actually. Um, and thank you so much for, if you all want to look in the chat, Akaya has shared uh, some of his work, the links to his work. So please feel free to check those out as well. Um, oh. But I will ask um, Bali and Mutle, is there anything that you'd like to add? I mean, Kai did such a good job in terms of making sense of how that thing is the thing that he's coming back to. So all the choices that he makes are, in, are to enhance that thing that sits at the center. Um, which is the poetry. Um, is there anything you guys would like to add in terms of thinking through that? Karen, definitely. I was, I was yeah. jumping up and down keen to do that because I think um, that's what distinguishes you from being a poet. You're not a theater maker. You're not actually a musician mm. or a poet. And I, I, I definitely agree with him in terms of sticking true to that. What I wanted to expand on was I also, for me more specifically, the bulk of my work is text-based. I have never thought a concept, it would be nice to, and then let me write to it, right? So I have a deep respect for Mutle explaining that he watched something over and over and over until he found the language and then frame by frame create, I mean, I think that's astounding. Um, so I wanted to speak to the practicality of that. So let's imagine that is you, that's where you're located. Some of the people in the room are writers and are poets, and that's just what you've done for now. How do I come to it um, to do my first production or how do what, mm. what that expansion, how do I do it? So what you've got to map out the poem. I'm guided by the poem. I am guided by the material and I'm also guided by the, the, the layers that are in the piece. So if the first things first is master craft, because if you master craft, your poet, your poem should be able to speak back to you in ways mm. that give you tone, um, in ways that give you color, in ways that give you image. It tells you, you get the sense from the work that what is left here, my voice is not enough or um, my movement is not enough. This is telling a story that requires, a, this, this expands on its own. So how I, what I would do as a, an example, I would break up my poem into seasons. So there were times that's how, when I started, that's how I, I developed the discipline of what's happening in the poem. So I'm, I'm mapping out quite specifically, quite thoroughly. I, I take that as an act in itself of the time from writing, from I have a poem to now I need to sit with this piece and I need to hear from this piece. And so one of my ways of doing that, which I, people have different ways, but I think it's important for us to also just, how do you do that? So I would have my summer, this, this is summer. What, what is this line saying? What is this image bringing forth? What is the combination of these two very different ideas that are meeting in this, in this line um, talking to me about? And then I found that quite intuitively, you begin a practice of being able to know that that is a movement. That's actually your body mm. moving in some way, or mm. that requires reverb somewhere. So mm. it first starts, I found that it first starts as, as a tonal, as a sound thing. But as I developed, it became, it's actually a particular repetition of a move. Mm. Or then as that last piece that I did, that I played for you, where the entire thing is just movement. I don't even actually perform the piece because the piece was about the sense of silence around the women who are attacked in North. So for me, representing that, the, the fact that I was the center focus, but without a voice was, mm. you know, so the piece talks to you as well. What am I talking to? I'm talking about silence. So what are the different ways that I can bring silence to the fore? And that's how can I make my audience, besides just bombarding them with words, how can I make them connect? to what I'm saying, how can they look at this and they're hearing me talking about it, but the person they're seeing is not someone who looks like they have agency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, yeah, I just, you, you have to develop a technique that begins, if we're saying it's text-based, then you, have, you develop a technique that enables you to read your own poem in different ways. And then you'll find that you have a decision to make because when we're talking multimedia, your, your options are you're going music, you're going uh, movement with dance, you're collaborating mm -hmm. 
Yeah, right. So you have your palette, and then it's a sense of where what serves the text best. That's what you're going mm. for. Not what's the clever thing to do. Yeah. I like that. What serves the text best? And even there, dropping your lines that your poem should be able to speak back to you to then guide you through what you need to amplify, which is, um, yeah, I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. Um, Mutle? Um, I actually wanted to, I was actually, I was I was just nodding my head <laughs> with <laughs> everything that you were saying. <laughs> but, and, and the, the, the trick I'd also learned was, um, there are times where someone will perform a poem and when you read it, it doesn't have the same impact it had on you when, they, when, it, when it lacks the performance. Mm. And then there are times where you will read the poem and when you see someone perform it and you're like, ah, oh, I, I, I was fine with it just reading it and having my voice recited in my head. And that's, that's where sometimes, especially you know, the, the beautiful thing about playing with multimedia is that sometimes you, you would even get to write for ads, for adverts. And when you start dabbling in that world, what will happen is people will give you visuals and say, please create something around this, this audio visual material. And now you have to create the text around that, you know? Um, and what I always was always cognizant of is, even if you were to strip the audio, the poem of the audio visual and you were reading it by yourself in your own corner in your room, I needed to still have the same impact it would have if it had the audio visual complementing it. That's always for me been a very, very important thing because I think that gives it strength as well that the poem autonomously still has its strengths. And sometimes as well, I mean, the beauty of what we are now exploring is sometimes you could mute the, the, the poem and the visuals could still speak to you the same way. The same way the music, I mean, it complements, but it has that, 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 uh, that room tone that speaks to you either way. So the, every, every one of these things autonomously has its own weight and it should always carry through even when the other part has been stripped away. So that's, mm. that's always been something that I, I am, I'm always cognizant of. And um, I love how everybody unknowingly gets it right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like if I mute if I mute their poem and I just watch the visuals, I'm still blown away. Um, and I think because of the corona that had happened, there had been a large movement of people moving towards, you know, taking these artworks and then making them accessible to you in the quickest way uh, possible. And it was just, you know, create the audio. I mean, slams went online. Um, a lot of the audiovisual works, there was a huge surge of audiovisual work that came out during the Corona times. Like people were having um, music sessions at their own homes. There are whole albums that came out where people were just mm. saying, you know, um, you know, uh, the lockdown music or the, lo the lockdown jazz album. So these were things that, and I was like, ah, so that means this thing does carry weight and it, it definitely has its own platform and it's, it's creating a, a, a huge uh, untapped market that we need to definitely start exploring a lot more. Mm. Okay, yeah. that's cool. And Mufi, I think I actually, I like the the kind of thing that you said where if you mute other stuff, this thing should be able to stand by itself. And I think that's such Yay. a key strategy about making sure that the poem is still at the center. Because if all the, yes. all the kind of amplifications go away, what is the poem actually saying? Um, exactly. So I think that's a good way to root yourself and to understand whether you're losing yourself in this process, or whether you're actually mm. winning in terms of, of amplifying with other tools. Um, yes. So yeah, thank you guys all for that. Um, I'm just going to reference our, our the CCA's uh, multimedia production, the Poetics for Transformation. So, I mean, we were really lucky to be able to work as a multidisciplinary team where each person added their expertise to the production. So there was like a visual artist, the editor, I'm a researcher and archivist, we've got musicians. Um, and so we were able to pull a whole lot of skill sets together to make something. Um, and the other aspect of that is that it was a funded project. So we were funded by the NIHSS and we had the financial backing to put the small team together. Um, and then the, the last aspect of it is that we all had been working remotely. So we were able to kind of make a production um, from where we were sitting at home. We had all the tools, all the kind of hardware that we needed. Um, but this not, might not necessarily be the case for a lot of poets, especially somebody who's working on their own. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of get into 
this idea of the skills and resources that you need to create in this way, in like a very like tangible way. Um, and I want to start specifically with Mbali because, you know, as a woman, you're entering into this kind of techie world, which is kind of more traditional, traditionally male rather. Um, so what kind of skills and knowledge have been critical to working in this way for you outside of collaboration, which yourself and Kaya mentioned? Um, and how have you gone about gaining those kind of skills um, that you need? Bali, I think you might be muted. Mute. There we go. I yeah. am on mute. I don't know why I'm mute because it just never, it's never ending. Um, mm. Definitely <laughs> something, thank you, Karen. I mean, I think mm. there's definitely something to be said about having wanted to and then tried to set out to try and develop a career in this way as a young Black woman. Um, mm. I think also in our context, in terms of just the socio-political, the context you are in as that young Black woman, um, where we have the arts, but even in the arts, poetry is literally, it's the ghetto of the arts, like we're at the bottom of the of that totem. Um, okay, my mm. opinion. Um, so <laughs> the challenges you're facing, <laughs> The challenge, you know, we talk about arts in general and they're challenging the arts. And I'm like, yeah, and then you're a poet. It's like double jeopardy. But okay, so for me, because I, I wanted it and I decided, and this is what interested me. One, I will tell you that my I was helped a lot by developing in Cape Town at the time that I came up because that was a city where public performance is a really big thing. Uh, theater is, is widely celebrated and accessible. I just found things very accessible. So the first thing I did was study. I realized that I wanted, I felt the urge to do this, but I did not have the skills. So the first thing I did was expand my thinking one and go one, firstly, look at poets who have done it. Right, let us not go and look at other artists. Let we also have poets who have worked mm. in this way in different ways, forebearers who have done it. So, who's done it? And then starting locally and then looking across the continent and then expanding that um, internationally. Who and then I discovered who that was for me. So, the first thing I'll say is that you have to have an understanding that you're building your own curriculum. So your mindset has to be, I'm literally building a curriculum. So who are the people uh, I feel like a sense of affinity to in terms of what they do? Then you compile those guys. And then if you can, because we have such challenges of data and that sort of thing, but if you can, you try and focus and watch as much as possible, um, catch as much as possible of what, what is, and we're fortunate now, I think even more so than when we, we were coming up because everything is literally so accessible and you can get, you can access really interesting content all the time if you're looking mm. for it. What mm. are you looking for? You're looking for poets who are working in different, in different ways. So that's what I did. Then I attended everything I could attend and I didn't always have the money to do that. So I would look out for the free shows I would look out for the matinees where, you know, the prices are, are slightly less. And I, I literally constructed that to first get myself an education. The first thing you have to do is be a student. Then I quickly realized that there, this is, a, you know, it's, a, it's quite, it's finance intensive if, mm -hmm. you don't, yeah. if you don't have the stuff, you know. Mm. So then the next thing was, okay, what do I have? Have an inventory mm. of what do you have? Yes, you're going to look at these incredible things that inspire you. And you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to start creating <laughs> any of this in my own way. Like, either you're going to wait or you're just going to get going. So get going. That's the one thing I'll say is just get going. What have you got? In this day and age now, we've got our phones, um, our left, you know, software and um, our hardware is just so much more sophisticated than it was at mm. that point. So even if you don't necessarily have to have a Mac, um, you can do incredible things with your Android. You can do incredible things if you then have that platform as well. So that's the next thing I did was what, what's my inventory? What have I got? And also then what have I got is what's around me? What's the wealth around me? What can I work with? Which Kai has mentioned already. What can I create with? So mm -hmm. you may have an instance where now I want to work. I didn't start off working with footage. So that came a little bit later for me. I went straight into what's around and can we capture what, we, what we've got, essentially creating my own stock footage 
as it were. So even if it's grainy, even if I'll make it interesting, that's your task. So don't judge your process, don't judge your work. Even if your, your initial pro output, you know, is not exactly top class quality, that's okay, you're an artist. Find a way to link that in and bring that in. So using what you've got, but ideally you wanna get a decent phone. If we're saying now, let's say I do have, you wanna, you wanna get it, you can do that on your phone now. You don't even need to uh, be roping other people in uh, to actually do the visuals for you. If you don't have the money, you can do it yourself. But again, mm. study. I had to go research. How do I, I, I mean, I had a fear of tech. I was like, I'm not a tech person as we tell ourselves, particularly as women, because we don't see very many of us. Well, we do now and we're seeing a growth in that. But I was afraid of tech and that's okay mm. to be afraid of tech. But I decided that you have to teach yourself, so educate yourself, so get it out of your mind that you can't do it or you're going to have to wait for someone else to do it. I just immediately got going and did it. Mm. So, so in terms of that, so the software that you've got, you're using what you've got on, on the laptop. So mm. that clip was made from uh, something Chimpo. That's just apps that are here. The mm. difficulty becomes the technicalities of how do I learn to work with the different interfaces and, and no one can teach you that, unfortunately. You have to, there's access to YouTube tutorials, but mm. you have to, decision you make you have to first make the decision all of the tools are now there so before I collaborated that that was my mentality that one I'm going to have to study as much as I possibly can who's here doing the same kind of work which is kind of the same idea of the people who have decided to be with us this evening know that yeah. this is an area of interest for them yeah so start there then researching broader I'm a great supporter of look beyond what you know mm. that is the greatest advice i'm going to give you look force continuously push against the boundary it doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're going to create but it's important to get as broad a sense as possible as what could happen what's out there what field in, and it's enlarging the space for you to be strong as well because it'll develop your vocabulary you have to develop mm. a, vocabulary, a vocabulary for film so yeah. if I want to work with film, what happens in film? What are the different things that I can do in film? So research mm -hmm. is a very big one for me. And that's something you can do for yourself, especially now. Then the for software sure. that you find here, um, there's nothing in particular, Karen, that yeah. I, I use. I'm consistently just looking at, and now it, it, everything's there for you. I just it's use true. <laughs> saying literally no you just type on that on google i want to mm. edit or i want to and then you just find the one that works for you but you can use what and you can go into the computer shops and try and find mm. you know if you don't have a laptop go and take your 30 rands and go and take your five rands and go in there and just learn the interface if that's all you can do but mm. upskilling yourself is really important i think particularly even for women because i was laughing with karen and i was saying yeah. it would take just to get things off the ground sometimes because you're looking at the guys mm. and so it's, it's four coffees first and you know hanging mm. out and going here five times first and the work just never gets going so that was a, a huge frustration for me so it became very important that I understood the language and even then when I did graduate to getting opportunities that enabled me to collaborate and learn further I had a yeah. base and Standing. you have your own vocabulary mm. even if it gives you the confidence to articulate ideas the power guys is not in the ideas themselves the power mm. is in our capacity to articulate our ideas in yeah. the marketplace because your voice your perspective how you're located is the currency in an economy of ideas so you've for actually sure. something, you've got something very very valuable at this mm. time for sure i hope and that that, that you know gave um, you know, I, I, I don't know if we're, we're talking now as well in terms of where we get the footage or where, when you do look, but I mean, we'll, we'll take a pause for that. And I think, and yeah. I just acknowledge also Ishmael, I think Ishmael has always been quite a big fan. You know, he, he kind of said when he was starting out in theater, he used to sit in the theater every evening and kind of watch what people were doing. And that's how he learned. And I think that's building kind of from the same ethos is that, you know, if you want to learn about something, learn from the people who are already doing it and then start building your own kind of vocabulary. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Kaya. He's like itching. Um, and I think a really cool thing that came up in our discussion, Kaya, um, this week was kind of like you said you can jump into a project, but you can be the person who's like 
drawing the artwork for the CD, or you can be the person who's like creating the the base uh, the baseline for something, or you could be the person who's writing. And I think it would be cool to just also break down in terms of how do you approach learning and then being able to pick up the skills. Is it from other people? Is it from just your own kind of curiosities and then going down the rabbit hole with glee? <laughs> I blame the rabbit holes. Okay. Always the rabbit holes. Uh, <laughs> I just get curious and I get deep. Um, yeah, I just put up a list. I, I, I just put up a list on the chat of mm. some of the tools that I use. And you'll see that some of them are generic. Some of them you have to buy. Some of them are free. Some of them you know, and some of them you probably don't. Um, mm. For example, um, Mandelbulb Fractal Generator is a mathematical uh, engine. People who know maths and are trying to work with 3D rendering tools are using them. Uh, people who are actually making lots of NFTs are using Mandelbulb, um, what do they call them? Mutations, mutations of the source code. They're using that to make um, visual content that can be stamped as unique, which is what NFTing and all of that stuff is. But it's just like anything that you make that's unique, a song, a painting, a drawing. Um, fractals are unique in the fact that they're generated mathematically. So there's an exact formula that marks this fractal as unique. Um, I use Mandelbulb particularly to make the covers of my first two books. And the covers of my first two books look starkly different. One is of these blue orbs that are touching almost like eggs in mitosis that are splitting, while the first cover is like a spiral. You know, it looks like a black hole or something. So they look quite different. And if I wanted to say, hey, let me uh, register these as unique to me, I could do that now with the NFT system. Back then, if I made a book cover, I probably would have sold it to the publisher who paid for it. In Ooh. this case, I was the publisher, so I would keep all the rights. Um, <laughs> but yeah, more often than not, if I made a book cover, it's to the artist, the graphic designer who was paid by the studio that published my work, and I never have access to my intellectual property, even though I made the book cover. But we live in a time where you can, you can own your intellectual property and create it mm -hmm. by yourself. Actually, NFTs are late. Uh, there's something that people don't know that's very simple that you can do to actually copyright your own work. The mail it to yourself principle. Mm. That old thing of take a piece of work, put it in an envelope, seal it, and never open that envelope. Mail it to yourself, write the address, and send it through the post office so it goes through the system. It's actually a very simple way of copywriting your own work, and it is legal mm. in every yeah. court of law as far as I know. Right. right. To copyright your own <laughs> work. A very simple trick. It's such a simple trick, right? But now we're using blockchains and systems like that because we work on an international framework where we're not just copywriting our work to keep on ourselves, but to send it out mm. there so people see it first, right? There's all kinds of things yeah. like marketing and profit involved, right? Mm. Now, these, these, these resources that I've put up on the list are very simple resources. Like I said, some are free, some are not, right? But if you put them to use mm. for your poetry, it's a totally different thing, right? Because people are making yeah. memes these days. It's a huge thing. You make a meme, bloody, bloody, blah. Mm. But then there's intellectual property that is for more value than just laughs and scroll down, right? A poem has to mean something to you. A poem has to make some kind of impact and stay. There has to be a stain, a poetry stain in you after the mm. poem's done. You know what I mean? Um, like there was that that poem um, I saw earlier from, from this video. Um, yes. From Poetry Africa where this woman said, um, we, we bow our tongues to, you, you know, this, this woman is talking about how women have to tame themselves and build this cave in their mouths to fill mm. your name and how women are always in some kind of subjugation, even internally. Um, and this constant state of, of violence against women. And that stayed with me way mm. after the poem, that idea of a tongue bowing in the cave mm. in her mouth. You know, that's poetry for you. It's the images that stayed. It's film, it is graphics, it is all of that. Mm. 
there's there's online tools as well that you can use. Um, there's social networks that you can use to, to push your poem forward. Kaya Masego writes is still up and I quit Facebook. But when I look at the intelligence, the analytics on my mm. on my Facebook, when I look in the back end, I'm still getting over 300 views a day for something I haven't accessed in two years. But because mm. I built the content and I loaded it up and pushed it every single day, it's still pushing my name. Mm. So there are tools we can use that work for us even when we're no longer working with them. That's why you must leave your stamp yes. on the mm. net. You must leave your stamp on the book collection. You must be in a bookshop. You must be in a video collection. You should be in a poetry collection, some paintings, you know, so mm. that the name stays and feeds the brand, which is your future. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's also just kind of like a perspective or an approach. So you've got a, a myriad of apps that are out there, a myriad of programs that are out there that you can utilize for yourself. This is about thinking through how to use them and then uh, exploiting them to your gain, so to speak. Um, yeah, choose the tool that works to your skill set. Choose the tool that works for you. Mm, yeah, now that's cool, man. Mutle, I want to bring you in here as well. I know you said your foray into this started with the uh, movie maker on Windows, <laughs> <laughs> which I still think because it's, it's there. What Bali is saying, you start with what you have and that's what you yeah. had. Um, yeah. And so how has your journey kind of looked in terms of gathering more skills and kind of being able to, I guess, create more complicated or more layered kind of productions? Um, um, I think the, the, the most, uh, I, I really took what I had at my mm. disposal and I applied it as best as I could. Um, now, later on, I think I started then researching and the beautiful thing is YouTube tutorials, are, sometimes they can feel like a whole university. You could do a short term course, but also I discovered something called Udemy where you mm. can go online and you can do a, a three month course for 150 or 120 rands, you know? Um, so I started doing things like that where I would try to upskill myself. I mean, um, as much as there was audio visual for me to improve myself as a performing artist, I tried out yoga and I was like, okay, how do I, how do I better myself as a yoga um, um, person or as a yogi and then I actually did a three month course on, on Udemy for like uh, 140 rands so these things are becoming I think the more you start looking the more you start seeing ways you could bypass the the need to pay more and also the mm. the illusion that you need to pay exorbitant amounts of money for you to be able to upskill yourself sometimes the more you even just ask people around you you will actually get information about what mm. you can do at a lower cost. And also sometimes you won't even have to pop out anything out of your pocket, just about speaking to people. And also, I mean, collaborations do actually work. They are quite yeah. helpful, um, but technologically, honestly, if, you, if you're looking hard enough, you will find something that will enable you to do exactly what you have as a vision in your mind, you know? Um, so mm. just look. Honestly, if you have money for data to be on social network, you have data that you can use to upskill yourself in applying it in a myriad of ways as an artist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now I hear you on that. And that's super sound advice, man. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to, to also look at this kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, intellectual property, right? So... I think we tend to kind of be scared of that arena in terms of, oh, am I going to get in trouble if I use somebody else's uh, existing work? Um, or, you know, what, what, it's more like a, a red flag than it is a green one. Um, and I just wanted to firstly pick uh, Kaya's brain a little bit more about what you're speaking about in terms of NFTs. And then secondly, to Tumbali and to Mutle. And um, what kind of strategies have you guys been able to use to kind of get around these intellectual property um, concerns? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Kaya first and then we'll, we'll touch on the other kind of strategies that we can use. Uh, 
I got I got lucky, but it was also a matter of personal choice. Um, I was studying political science, but I decided to get into internet studies. Mm. So I was always aware of um, server building tools and things like that, how people build um, tickets, they're called tickets or licenses, you know, unique mm. pieces of card that say that this is unique and it maybe expires in an hour or maybe in a hundred years. This ticket could last anything as long as it's coded to be that way, right? And my lecturer predicted NFTs a long time ago because he said, what's stopping us from making a permanent ticket? We make 2000 tickets and there are no more tickets ever, ever again. And if mm -hmm. anyone has one of these tickets, they only have one of the tickets that we made. And so there'll never be a way that we have fake or counterfeit tickets. Every ticket is yellow and has a number that's ours, right? That's computer science talk, but it spoke to the future of everything that is about intellectual property. Mm. Because my book is unique. My poem is unique. I record my poem. I put it up to YouTube. You download my poem from YouTube and use it at your show make a lot of money at your show and I never see a cent, right? But mm -hmm. with this world that we live in now, I can digitally stamp my work so that even if you show it out there in any way, as soon as it moves, that ticket is unique and it is marked that that ticket is moving. Nothing else, not a copy of the ticket, not anything else, just that ticket. And I immediately have to get paid or the ticket expires. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. the world we live in with NFTs. There's no such thing as I can be cheated off my work anymore. Mm. And it's, it's a terrible world because there's lots of scamming that can be done. I can make fake NFTs. I can make tickets that expire tomorrow or in an hour, right? But with this world that we live in now, I decide how long this ticket lasts. So I make my work to last as long as I need it to. And that should be forever to feed my mm. kids, to feed my kids' kids so that my poem never gets into the wrong hands. Mm. What if someone takes Mbali's poem that we just saw right now and sends it to Arista Records and uses it forever, mm. right? Easily possible, but it's digitally stamped to this conversation. So it's hers. Mm. You see, and if we looked mm. through this chat, actually, there's a digital license for the timestamp that she showed us her video. Mm. As a thinker and as a person who works with these digital systems, I could not cheat her out of her thing, mm. you see, because of the world that we live in now. But back in the days, people stole women's ideas, man. Women couldn't even graduate with their doctoral theses because her her lecturer stole the idea, mm. you know? She wrote a great English novel, but because she's a woman, it never saw the light of day. And somehow her professor gets the award for great mm. novels, so piercing it, you know? We, 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 we used to live in a world where we can cheat people out of the intellectual property. That's changed. Yeah. And it comes about building these tickets and a blockchain of work. There's no such thing as a blockchain of non-work. There's only work. And these tickets only get made when work happens. Mm -hmm. Just like I was saying about Mbali's video. Yeah. The ticket was only created when she showed us the video. And if the video had never gotten out there, the ticket would have never been made. Mm -hmm. So now she has mm -hmm. actually what is called an IP stamp. An IP address stamp that is marked for her. Yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's amazing. We live in a really amazing world that allows opportunity for keeping our rights. Yeah. And we need to just be aware of the technology and how it works. And reading up on it is how to save yourself from getting damaged by it. Because there's mm -hmm. lots of people who will exploit your ignorance in not knowing your intellectual property rights and building mm -hmm. tickets. Because this NFT thing is just but one system that is abusing the blockchain. There's mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies that are using the blockchain as well. There's political systems that work for irrigation that use the mm. blockchain system. Other countries are using it for other work that is not creative, yeah. that is political, that is directly governmental. 
But for us, mm. this means a lot more because our paintings are secure, our writing is secure, our videos are secure. Yeah, I think that's definitely an arena that we need to have a further education in because before like the intangible or the concept or, you know, um, you string words in a really unique way has not been protected by tradi traditional like intellectual property frameworks. So I think it's it's an enabling environment that we need to think about a little bit more and also share as, I mean, as artists in general, but as poets specifically. Um, and then just referencing our, our kind of own production, I mean, we, we made sure not to uh, step on toes by kind of using photographs with Creative Commons license or kind of using footage that had been created by the CCA, so it was owned by the CCA. Um, but I mean, there are other strategies that you can use to, to kind of uh, respect uh, when you use other people's uh, existing artistic works. And I just want to, yeah, I'll, I'll first uh, step to Mutle about that and then also hear from Bali's side how she, how she kind of um, navigates that. Um, look, <laughs> No, I think for me, this is such a tricky arena, mm -hmm. um, also a space because I am so clueless. Um, you know, one, one of the first things um, when I started writing poetry and I had a, a moment where I would take one of, because what we're in essence doing, I mean, being creative is to put together a sequence of words or a sequence of letters in a way that it generally doesn't exist in the world like when when I, I would put lines from my poems on um google and I'd, I'd search maybe like a full line and it would say you know search doesn't exist or that that specific pattern of words doesn't exist so mm. that means if we are looking at the world wide web this specific sequence of letters does not exist and it is that unique. And someone could come and take mm. it and plagiarize it and take it as their own. So for me, one of the things that also made me sort of like um, apprehensive for putting out, cause I haven't put out a lot of, I haven't put out work that I'm selling in a very long while is because mm. I don't know this arena. And I really had to step back mm. and actually now start doing research about how it is I'm gonna put out the work. One, in a way that it doesn't infringe on other people's creativity and the work that they've put out. And two, it also secures me in a way that if I'm moving forward and I've put out work like, like I've, I've put out, it's not plagiarized and someone else cannot um, swindle me out of my work or, or what is what is due to me. So you ha I actually have to go back and say, okay, if I can't do this, can I get a lawyer? Can I actually mm -hmm. have someone who can be on my side and actually step up to me and say, okay, these are the ways in which you need to protect your work and these are the ways you need to, you need to navigate your work. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can just be as simple as you reading out the information on the net or if you have friends that are coming to doing law and are still you know, in, in tertiary, but you can actually sit them down and ask, ask them questions because people are also willing to give information out. Mm -hmm. I think we also downplay that, that people who are close to you or they can direct you where you can get information in a way that, um, you can protect yourself in easy ways. Because even now, as I'm listening, I'm just like, Jesus Christ, can I start following Kaya? And start, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my head, I'm just like, you know, these are the sort of people that, you, and, and I mean, now, I mean, it's 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 it, uh, it's that six degree rule that how mm. far are you from information that you might need? Mm. How many steps do you need to take for you to get close to that information? You know, and this is a platform like that. So that if I'm going to be asking him in an inbox and be like, yo, even if it's not you telling me exactly what I need to do or what, what I need to avoid, can you plug me into resources that I can apply in order for me to, I don't know, to, 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 to safeguard myself from these, from these things? So um, I'm not clued up. But I can definitely say that it's platforms like these, even our workshop, that will enable you to actually take a step in the right direction as to how you might need to navigate this space and how you can protect yourself. Right, cool, cool, cool. And Bali? I don't know if there's anything valuable to add on my side, except just how completely impressed and mind blown I am by the new insights that I've learned this evening. And I just said to Kaya in the chat box, I said this, NFT comment that the wealth of knowledge that he has in this area is a workshop. You know, that's also an avenue for you. That's a unique stamp in your language, as you would say, avenue mm -hmm. that I think I, I think I have nothing to say. I've struggled 
in this area, I'll be honest. Um, and I've also made very significant mistakes along the way as well. It wasn't something that I, I paid attention to at the beginning mm -hmm. and I didn't care. And so part of my growth has been um, really respecting the importance of attribution because you just kind of, I'm a creator, oh, this looks great. I'm gonna build a thing around this thing. And you actually are um, using something someone has created and you aren't even acknowledging the fact that they're in, they're in that, they, they've made something and you think it's so amazing, you've used it and you haven't even given anyone else the opportunity to discover the work of that artist. So I think from just um, a respect and honoring yourself as an artist is to understand the importance from a community perspective that it's important so attribution mm. is one is one way that i've i've gotten really really better like as mutle as well i haven't put out anything for a while that's mm. just going to sit outside me i had to also consolidate um and look at the pop the process um and see where the child the, the major challenges and the pitfalls were for me in that area mm. but i do know that one of them was that i did see a shift in beginning to uh just acknowledge you know even if nessus mm. someone who shot it for me in holland or this is sarah jane and she actually shot this i directed it yes i had the concept but this is who this creative is who this is who this person is but i've definitely made um i don't know a practice of Commons, Creative Commons, and open source. I, mm. I now live there. Yeah. If I if I feel like, and it's it's really just creative exploration at that as well. Because I like I said, I I believe that we now are capable of creating our own work. You can create your own footage. You can you can make, um, you know, the the sound poetry that you intend on making where you are. So I've I've found that in fact an even easier process than having to go and search. On, I'm like, this is what I'm feeling. This is the idea. What's in the house? Like, what if I just like took this shot, uh, bent over the bed, mm. looking at the ceiling in a different way? How's that corner? And what does that corner speak to? And so that's the practice I've adopted. But mm. um, in so far as, you know, having any major issues of, of my own work that, uh, I don't know, I, I suppose perhaps it's one of the business failing aspect of, of mine, if, if I look at it like that, that I, I've had a, a pretty sort of, I, I don't know, I haven't been as, I'm not as fixated on, on how my work lives. Mm. Um, I haven't, yeah, you know, I haven't really felt the major, and maybe that's a, a good thing. I'm fortunate in that I, I haven't really felt I've really, really had bad instances of that happening in, in ways that have, have been extremely detrimental to my uh, capacity to earn and that sort of thing. But mm. definitely moving forward that there's been the learning stage and now, okay, if I'm going to incorporate what I've learned over the years and build a career, even if it's a diversified one now, mm. what are areas of importance? So definitely Mutla as well. So I began to look at who else do I need? I need a mm. lawyer. I need mm. a uh, those are things I had never looked at. I had never thought about. I need a lawyer. I need someone who is going to understand the tech world better than I do. And what does that mean? How, how am I? Is that, you know, am I paying that person? How is that working? Is that, a, is that an exchange? Is it someone I know? But I started, I started paying attention to also mm. the wealth of, of resources in terms of people, as he's saying. Um, so I definitely would be very keen to see Kaya uh, give um, that it's a niche area, but it's definitely right on the mark. Um, yeah. The work we, we are creating, being in this particular platform right now, being located with an interest here or working, you know, having built a level of skill in this area is not something to be taken lightly, I think, in the era that we're in and moving forward. I think we've got something. And I think that if we are learning from people like Okaya, we are also then going to begin, begin to sort of know how to be sophisticated um, yeah. in it. In it. Yeah. But I'm yeah, I, I just think a workshop, I think if, if there's one comment, I think he definitely needs to host a workshop on that. <laughs> I hope you're listening to this, Kaya. <laughs> we are all behind you. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the gosh, we knew that it was going to be a very 
compressed amount of time to want Ooh, to cover so I much told stuff. you, I told I, you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I told you. Um, but I think I think what we can try and do, um, Mutle, Mbali, and Kaya from your side, I mean, Kaya's already started a kind of list, um, but if you can pop in kind of programs or suites or softwares that you've worked with that people can play around with, and as has been expressed here. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's you. You have to take the initiative to go and explore these things for yourself. Tinker around, make your mistakes, do what you need to do. So, just a couple of programs that people can walk away from this workshop with that they can go and tinker with and see if they can make stuff. And simultaneously, also open up the floor to say, are there any questions that we would like to direct to our co-leaders? Um, please, this is now the time to just either pop it in the chat or to raise your hand and we'll take those, uh, we'll take those questions. Um, I'll give people an opportunity to just uh, think about themselves. it. <laughs> All right. Just while we do that, just quickly, I think one aspect that we've touched on very briefly, but because we're running out of time, it's the sort of thing that's not going to make it as a resource, but definitely also educate yourself on the institutions that support this kind of thing. These exchanges that have happened uh, have made people like Mutle and I. Um, you know, the, 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 the partnerships that are happening, like the work that the Buddha is doing, like the British Council, um, like Pro Havalsha with the Swiss, those organizations are also, you know, you don't, if you don't know them and you don't know about it, it's not that you, if you're not in that network, you don't know that that's available to you and you have a right to pitch things to them. You have, you have a right to go in and, you know, talk to someone about the ideas you have in mind. And you may meet, you know, people who are, are open, who are interested in what you're doing and then facilitate exchanges. And that, ex that those exchanges were instrumental for me in terms of expanding my broad view and my toolbox in terms of being exposed so um, yeah, I can list the organizations with pleasure. That, that much I can do for you. And, but I want to encourage you to know that at whichever point you are at, you have the right, you know, have because we don't think we do when we don't know how the processes work. You have the right to, to engage with somebody or there or at least ask questions or begin to be comfortable around um, institutional support systems as well. Yeah, thank you for that, Mbali, as well. In terms of, I mean, uh, poetry in general, you're working in, within financial constraints consistently, <laughs> um, but to know who you can approach to to actually support you in your work, I think is an important one. So, uh, Cece, Celestina, thank you for asking that question. So at least you have a, a grouping of people that you can approach as well. Um, uh, one other question that I do want to ask to, to our co-leaders here in the workshop is, um, you guys have been working in this area for some time. What would be an intervention that you need at this point to get multimedia projects kind of more, what do you call it, this, whatever the word for this is poets, <laughs> this. <laughs> How do you give multimedia projects more of that? Um, I'll start with Mutle because uh, Mbali is giving us all the fantastic organizations <laughs> we have. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, honestly, right now, I think it's just a matter of putting our product. Um, the more product you put out, the I think it, it's definitely going to join a large range of other products that are currently going out now. Um, it's 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 a it's it's a growing space. Um, and also, I just wanted to just to add on something there when it comes to the stuff that Mbali is adding onto the the list is that um, hear my voice has an annual retreat, like a poetry retreat, where people can actually um, pitch to go to a retreat for I think it's like five days or a couple of days where you are going to be collaborating with other poets um, and other artists in order for you to, to, to learn and to grow and to actually expand your abilities as an artist. So it's, it's spaces like this and even you know with word and sound or with, with um, 
what is this current state of poetry they are also going to be running workshops as well for people to actually expand their abilities to write their abilities to perform or to to build themselves as well as business as min administrators because it's one thing for you to know how to be, be to be a poet but it's another thing to manage yourself as a poet you know so it's all these things that we need to constantly be aware of but outside of that um, when it comes to multimedia artworks i think follow your instincts everybody who is here on this platform was following their instincts and that's what made them unique and I think that's what will make us unique is following our intuition as well, because um, in that, that's where we find new works. If we're trying to copy other people, then you're just going to be a part of the wave that's flowing and you get left behind once the wave has fallen away. But if you're constantly digging into yourself and you're trying to figure out ways that you can best express how uniquely you manifest, I think then we would find unique works and then your artworks would stand out. Um, what Mbali has done, what, what Kaya is doing, what I have done, what a myriad of other poets have done, the minute their work stood out, it was because it spoke of their unique um, signature. So I think that's, that's, that's always been the thing that I encourage everybody to do. And, and that's why I was even when we were having the conversation, I kept saying that um, I can't teach you what to do, but I think what I could teach you is to point my finger at you and say, what can you do? Um, what are you unique at doing? And let's 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 cultivate that. So yeah, that's oh. that would be my thing. Oh, dope. I dig that. Um, uh, Kaya, thank you for rejoining us. Um, uh, we just want to hear your thoughts outside of the NFT workshop that you're going to have for all of us. <laughs> um, what's another kind of timely intervention that is needed around um, multimedia productions at the moment? You know, there's actually not enough there's not enough uh, madness happening right now um there's way too much of the same thing oh the screen is a little bit low um there's not enough madness i feel there's just not enough wild totally out there people who are pushing the boundaries of the art and um i feel like that's what we need we need things that people can't swallow um the, the, the recent conversation I had with Ursula Rucker and some queer poets um, on Twitter spaces, you know, um, was that we need to start building work that stands out, that isn't of, of the usual, of the norm. We have run of the mill stuff, you know, that's why we make pop music. We make pop music so that we have stuff to listen to in the car on the way to work. There's popular music, you know, there's stuff for the gym, you know, stuff you can pump iron to because it just sounds funky and it's normal. We have everyday music, but we need out there stuff that pushes the boundaries of, of understanding, of language, of gender, of religion, of faith. Push these boundaries further and further of, of visual stimulation, you know. Um, I, the best poem I saw was actually a 16 minutes long poem that involved i would say probably like 15 18 sentences but they were drawn out and it's a performance poem in a sense something that the audience couldn't swallow they were like when is when is the real thing coming but you don't realize you're in the real thing until it's got you by the throat like real work uh, that that you can exploit and so you can utilize the aspects of drama right rather than utilizing the aspects of music you can utilize the aspect of full-on theater dress up costume um you can utilize noise actually i've been working with noise lately i've been building instruments out of garbage and using my mouth and making unique samples mm -hmm. because i have i have the when i make samples myself I hold all the rights to the work that I've just made because I used my samples. I didn't take this from a database of samples or use Buster Rhymes or Wheezy sample. This is mine. And so when it comes into the ear of someone, it also comes with that stamp of originality. And so this is why I ask for madness because madness is that originality that people can't swallow. It's that fresh thing, that heavy thing with real impact, with real meat. Because maybe after 
the same adverts of, you know, on August when it's Women's Month and we get the same talk from the same offices that don't have a copywriter. Obviously that person doesn't know how to creatively write and speak to the issue. We end up getting bored and we lose the purpose of the work, which is awareness, which is growth, which is building safer communities. Our poetry isn't for just entertainment, right? It's for growth, personal as well as external. So the tools we use and the medium we use then become more important. So I mean, I, I'm exploring all these different angles of my own work in order to really build a new and fresher impact and a fresher way of attacking this thing that we collectively call poetry. Oh, thank you for that, Kaya. Um, we're at the end of our time and I'm bummed. <laughs> I'm really bummed, but I want to give thanks to Kaya Chumbali Chumutle for, yeah, just being open enough to actually participate in this workshop. Um, it took a lot of reflection time and being able to just kind of compress that and harness that into tools that you can pass on to the next set of people who want to work in this way. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure as do the, the partners who are presenting this jointly. Thank you to the CCA and thank you to Hear My Voice NGO um, and also to the partners who supported us in this, which is uh, the Guta Institute, the French Institute of South Africa um, and Flanders, as well as Walloni Roxfeld. Um, there is going to be a, a poll at the end of this uh, session. Um, and Ishma, I don't know if it's possible to invite you to just give us a little brief about that um, before we close out the, the session. Karen, can I just, just, just to challenge, just since we're here and there's a question yes. about how we move forward, perhaps we do need to create a forum. Um, I think that even if it's a niche space, so mm. there's a need for skills transfer for a next generation that is, and that doesn't currently exist uh, mm. within the, the, you know, within the larger, the broader poetry space, that there's actually a niche space where we can uh, have, create a structure to be able to transfer the knowledge that Kaya has in that particular area. And then other poets who have, perhaps are skilled in uh, loosely, not necessarily building a whole other organization, but perhaps we do need a forum to, to continue the conversation. And then also, Kaya, to, to think, to put our heads together, to think about how we can then uh, begin to create that work and support each other in creating new work that is going to um, challenge, interest, inspire, inform, et cetera, in new ways and have new conversations around our art form. Because it, we've all said that the time is now, the future is visual. So where we're at mm. is the direction in which things are moving, whether it's an NFTs or anything. Uh, I've got, I'm sick. So that was my medicine, sorry. But just to say that, that I think one, and then I think two, uh, a display. Perhaps we could also do a very, very tight, well-organized, well-directed, well-curated showcase of this kind mm. of work and how it lives on stage so that young people are not just seeing it as a conceptual thing, but are actually coming in to experience the work and so that the work can live. Because I know that I was saying to Karin, it's been difficult mm -hmm. even in corporate spaces. They don't expect me to come in with a tech rider and things and instructions are around how I want my lighting and my audio and that sort of thing. They don't expect it and it's often difficult um, to transfer that into the other spaces that we work in in order to live. So I think perhaps, it, as Mutle is saying, to create product, I think we're also right on time in terms of the context and the climate being ripe for us to sharpen that. And then we have to be a part of uh, leading that process and helping others become um, in the space as well, because it's a niche area within our work. Yeah, no, here, here. Um, Kai has offered to set up that forum. Um, I don't know, Kai, put it out on Facebook and then we'll, we'll connect to you somehow, a very public platform, then we can all at least have some access to it. Um, Ishmael, please go forth. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thanks, Mutle. Thanks, Kaya. Thanks, uh, Mbali, for a really wonderful, inspiring, energized, invigorating, and a very progressive conversation about what we do next 
So it's not just to talk about what's happening, but, but the challenge that you give to us about what's to be next. Karen, thank you very much for putting this together, this panel, uh, and for organizing it. Kakaza, thank you on behalf of all the partners for the work that you've done in facilitating the series of workshops. Mm -hmm. Once again, from the Center for Creative Arts at UKZN and our partner, Yama Voice, and of course, our funders, the Goethe Institute, the French Institute of South Africa, Wallonie Bruxelles, and the representation of Flanders. Thank you for the support that you've given to us. At the Center for Creative Arts, we're quite committed towards ensuring that the kind of workshops that we present go beyond just uh, one hour sessions of dialogue, but that they do result in something more tangible. So what we'd like to do is we would like to put out a small grant uh, to, towards artists who've been in the series of workshops, who want to experiment, who want to create the kind of work, and we'll put out three grants of 10,000 rands each. I will send the uh, details to Kakaza on Monday morning, and everyone who's been part of the series of workshops could look at that. It's not going to be the kind of long uh, bureaucratic uh, systems of application. It will simply be a one pager that you need to send to us, uh, informing us of what you want to do. And we will select three projects that we think uh, could be developed with a small grant. We'd love to offer more, but that's what we could do with just uh, our current resources. So once again, thank you to all of you. We hope this has been an inspiring week. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Stay safe. And we'll see you at Poetry Africa from the 6th to the 16th of October uh, this year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please make up. sure to... <laughs> thank you so much for the space. It was awesome. Thank you. And thank you to Bash, who's been working back uh, behind the scenes as well. Thank you, Bash. Cool, guys, I think you'll see a poll on your screen. Please feel free to complete it before you exit the meeting. And thank you, everybody. Muslim, Bali, Kaya. Thank you, thank you. Coffees, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. I, I do the mute unmute very badly. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Bye, Bali. Have a great eve, everyone. Karen Angiboni Paul, I do not see it. Oh, word. It should have popped up. Bash, I know. Can, Kaya, can Kaya access the poll? <laughs>